Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, this talk will be um, an exploration of the making of modern Mercia. So it will be um, myself and Louise Campbell, who uh, we co-curated the exhibition together. Uh, my name is Jane Simpkiss and I am the art curator at Leamington Spa Art Gallery Museum. And um, Louise um, is a, well, taught for many years at the uh, History of Art Department in Warwick University and has published widely on 20th century art and architecture, notably Coventry uh, Cathedral, um, writing Coventry Cathedral Art and Architecture in Post-War Britain, um, Basil Spence Buildings and Projects, and most recently she has written Studio Lives, Architect, Art and Artist in 20th Century Britain. And her help has been invaluable in researching and designing this exhibition. Sorry, just actually, I might do that again, Louise, because my notes aren't in the right place. Sorry, and that's not very good having them. I don't want to have to look away so much. So take two and hopefully the final, the final take. Um, hello everyone, welcome to uh, today's talk. My name is Jane Simkis, I'm the art curator at Leamington Spa Art Gallery Museum and I am the curator of Modern Mercia, post-war art and design in Coventry and Warwickshire 1945 to 1970. Today, I'm going to be talking with my co-curator, Louise Campbell, about the making of this exhibition and kind of the various uh, challenges that we faced and what we really wanted to uh, explore in the show. Louise um, has taught for many years in the History of Art Department at Warwick University, and she's published widely on 20th century art and architecture, notably writing Coventry Cathedral, Art and Architecture in Post-War Britain, Basil Spence Buildings and Projects, and most recently, Studio Lives, Architect, Art and Artist in 20th Century Britain. So the exhibition, Modern Mercia, Art and Design in Coventry and Warwickshire, 1945 to 1970 at Leamington Art Gallery and Museum, was conceived in 2019 as the successor to the gallery's 2016 show, Concealment and Deception, The Art of the Camouflers in Leamington Spa, 1939 to 45, which looked at the Leamington-based artists who designed camouflage for factories and airfields during the Second World War. This earlier exhibition had drawn our attention to the rich art produced in the region in the mid 20th century and the artistic networks that had developed as a result of the Camouflage Directorate. And here you can see um, a lovely uh, pencil and watercolour drawing by Colin Moss, who is one of the camoufleurs. This shows uh, the morning after the Blitz in Dormer Place in Leamington's Bar. And to the left is the uh, poster for the exhibition, which shows another beautiful um, drawing by Colin Moss, um, which shows a camouflaged factory. So, um, in many ways, Modern Mercia aimed to answer the question, what came next? And uh, 2021 provided the perfect opportunity to answer this question as it coincided with Coventry City of Culture, which is obviously where the nation's eyes have been directed to Coventry and its history. So this new exhibition explored the work of artists, designers and architects who contributed to the post-war creative boom in this region and particularly the public art which they produced. And we aimed to shine a light on these artworks which we still live with today but which uh, many of which we often overlook. Modern Mercia took as its basis a collection of work by the painter Richard Dick Hosking and his wife, the sculptor Alma Ramsey Hosking, which was given to the gallery by their daughter, Sarah Hosking. And here you can see um, a lovely pair of portraits by the artist Nan Youngman, which were given to the couple um, for their wedding. Obviously, Alma is on the left and Dick is on the right holding their cat, Puffin. So uh, Coventry College of Art, which was where Dick Hosking was the principal from 1947 until 1964, formed part of uh, Coventry's post-war cultural infrastructure, along with the new art gallery, a municipal theatre and a new cathedral. 
And inevitably, the glamour and publicity surrounding the cathedral and the artists who work there has overshadowed the pioneering townscape being rebuilt around it. Coventry's embrace of new approaches to building and education, shopping, healthcare and housing in the 1950s was accompanied by an ambitious programme of public art. Thanks to the city architect, a uh, post first held by Donald Gibson. Sorry, this is just a lovely little landscape by uh, Dick Hosking. We're just passing through. Um, so thanks to, um, yes, the work of the city architect and his team and artists from the College of Art and elsewhere, Coventry became a showcase for new ideas about town planning and art for schools during the 1950s and 1960s. Our exhibition aimed to illustrate this through four key themes, and I'm going to uh, take you through them now, just looking at some of the slides. So uh, the first theme was public art, traditional, modern and folk, which explored the different public artworks produced in the area and their relationship to the prevailing art styles of the period. And here you can see uh, some of the beautiful folk inspired artworks and some of the more kind of modernist uh, works here by Peter Lajlo Perry. The second theme was called Design for Learning, Design for Living, which explored the art that was made for schools and the home. And here there are some beautiful um, textiles by the uh, designer Tibor Reich, and also some beautiful ceramics, which he designed for Denby. The third section was called Modern Art for Modern Churches and uh, in very much did what it said on the tin, explored the, the artworks that were produced for many of the new um, religious buildings produced after the war. And the final section was entitled Local Artists, Local Taste and it explored the work and lives of local artists in the region, particularly the Hoskings. And here, um, We've got a beautiful uh, drawing um, by Henry Fideski of the stained glass in the Church of Our Lady in Lillington. And I've put this on the screen because I wanted to highlight that um, although we wanted to take advantage of Coventry City of Culture, we were acutely aware that um, this exhibition was not happening in Coventry. And whilst Coventry was an epicentre for ideas of rebuilding and replanning in the area, um, and, that, and how that shaped the art and design being produced, it was by no means the only place that was affected by these ideas. So when we were planning this exhibition, we wanted um, to widen our focus to include Leamington, Warwick and Stratford-upon-Avon, where new schools, churches and public buildings uh, were also constructed um, during the post-war period and they likewise benefited from a comparable provision of public art. So this incredible uh, modern building and stained glass um, is in Lillington, so just um, so just in uh, Leamington Spa. So you can see these incredible buildings that are being produced outside of Coventry. This is another um, stunning stained glass piece by the artist Margaret Traherne, which is in a church in Wooten Wowen. This is the study for it. Um, one of the joys of the exhibition has been really highlighting these modern works of art in, in Leamington, Stratford and, and Warwick. Um, which are so often overlooked. And the two objects which I feel encapsulate this best are Wemus's presentation drawing of the Royal Spa Centre, which you can see here um, top left, uh, which was juxtaposed in the exhibition with James Brown's plan for a uh, proposed plan for Coventry swimming baths, which is uh, down on the bottom left. Um, and nowadays, walking past the Royal Spa Centre, um, one might not necessarily think of it as a, a prime example of modern architecture, but when juxtaposed with Brown's very modern swimming baths, uh, with the steel and glass and the, the winged roofs, you really get a sense of the prevailing styles of the period and the importance of incorporating that style into civic buildings. Leamington can, for obvious reasons, feel like a Regency town, but this comparison really helped me to get a sense of the modern creative rebuilding that was occurring across the region and which Leamington was a part of. So I'm going to hand um, over to Louise now, who's going to talk a little bit uh, more about the exhibition. Thank you very much, Jane. 
Well, I've done a lot of work on Coventry Cathedral and its artists in the past, but the present challenge was to look beyond the cathedral at what else. Was Louise, possible. can I just pause you for a second? Um, your sound's not very good. Okay, let me turn up. Let me put my microphone there. Is this any better? It's a little bit better. Is there any way you can get it uh, closer at all? Yeah, I'm bringing my microphone right under my chin. Uh, any better? Yes, that's definitely better. Okay. Okay, right. do you want to just start again? <laughs> so I'm now going to hand over um, to Louise, who's going to talk a little bit more about the exhibition, particularly uh, beyond the Coventry Cathedral. Thank you, Jim. I've done a lot of work on Coventry Cathedral in the past, but the challenge in the exhibition was to look beyond the cathedral at what else was happening in Coventry and in the surrounding region after the Second World War. Basil Spence used the emblem of the phoenix for his book about the cathedral, published in 1962, but the phoenix featured in the planning literature of the 1940s and was inscribed on the levelling stone on the right, which was laid to mark the centre of the replanned area of Coventry in 1946. The look of post-war Coventry, generously spaced, logically planned and pioneering, among other things, the separation of motor traffic from pedestrians, has faded from memory as key features have disappeared. And as the fabric of the city has changed, the public art, which the city's architects hoped would give pleasure and a sense of place, has deteriorated and its significance has been rather forgotten. Our exhibition tries to evoke the period, its art and its ideals by showing images and studies for the work created for sites in Coventry and the region, as well as their architectural framework. Well, with the LCC's open air exhibitions of sculpture in Battersea Park, 1948 and 1951, and the Arts Council's sculpture exhibitions, which toured the regions, including coming to Leamington in the 1950s, Sculpture really comes into the public eye. 2021 celebrates Coventry as city of culture. But 60 years ago, it was in fact a city of sculpture. And the range of work was extraordinary. Reliefs, freestanding sculpture, cast panels carried out in concrete, stone, fiberglass, bronze, aluminium, steel, wood and plaster. Some of the sculptors, George Wagstaff here on the left, John Skelton in the centre, Walter Ritchie on the right, were natives of the city. But others, perhaps more familiar to non-Coventrians, like Peter Perry, William Mitchell and Bernard Schottlander, based elsewhere, carried out commissions for sculpture in and around the city. Among our discoveries were works once assumed lost, like Nyad there in the center, found in George Wagstaff's garden, and the studies by Walter Ritchie for his sculpted reliefs, which belonged to his estate, and Perry's drawing for the Coventry sculpture in the showcase there behind the head of Nyad. Back to Jane now. This exhibition has really been a very special but challenging experience for me as a curator. It was my first exhibition at the gallery about a subject of which I was not a specialist, um, that I predominantly curated and researched from my kitchen table due to lockdown. Um, I started working at the gallery in April 2020 at the height of the lockdown and inherited this project from my predecessor. Luckily, Louise, that an authority in this subject was co-curating the show with me and so began my proper inauguration into this fascinating period of art and design of which I had only been casually aware. 
there were some key aspects of the art and design being produced in this period that particularly excited me and I'd like to take some time to discuss this here. I think ultimately my favourite part of curating this show has been the rich variety of styles that were produced during the period. From the faux medieval of Sir Guy and the Dun Cow here in the centre of the slide by Alma Ramsey Hosking, um, to the attenuated spiky modernist figures that we've already seen by Peter Lajolet Perry and John Hutton, to the figurative work of Nyad. Perhaps these works were being produced for public places um, because they were being produced for public places, they needed to appeal to all types of people, not just those who had a standing interest in modern art. So the sculptures we see in the gallery uh, could simultaneously belong to different periods, but at the same time are a clear product of one specific period when a spectrum of uh, artistic styles, sculptural styles, was wanted by city architects and designers. And I think, um, as you can see here on this slide, a prime example of this breadth of style was, uh, it can be seen in the works of Alma Ramsey Hosking. Here she has produced three very different um, artworks, which are all in the exhibition. So on the left, you have uh, watchers on the staircase, um, in the center, Sir Guy and the Dun Cow, and on the right, um, a very kind of Henry Moore-esque uh, marble sculpture called Mother and Child. The exhibition provided the opportunity to bring female artists like Alma Ramsey Hosking, but also Margaret Traherne, uh, bring them to greater recognition. Whilst Ramsey Hosking exhibited in Coventry and Stratford in group and solo exhibitions during her lifetime, her work is little known today. Unlike many male artists, she only had one major public commission, which was Sir Guy and the Dun Cow, and domestic responsibilities undoubtedly impacted her uh, art production and career. A lack of studio space meant that when it came, when she came to construct Sir Guy and the Dun Cow, I'll just go back to, so you can see it. Um, when she came to construct it, she had to do so in the front room of her house, carrying bu buckets of water um, through from the kitchen. Margaret Traherne is similarly little known today uh, beyond specialists despite major public commissions to produce stained glass for Coventry Cathedral and Liverpool Cathedral. Her exquisite sketch for a window in Wooten Warren Church showing the boy King of Mercia is exhibited in our show, which I hope will spark further interest in her career. Well, curators always have a sort of niggling regret about the ones that got away. And in this case, one of the things that we couldn't include in the exhibition uh, is particularly fascinating, and I'm going to talk about it briefly now. Internationalism and a spirit of reconciliation with old enemies have come to be identified with Coventry and its cathedral. But like the emblem of the phoenix, they're embedded throughout the post-war city. Nowhere is it more evident than in this sculpture called Pax, or Peace, installed in the Garden of Rest at Canley Crematorium in 1945 to commemorate the victims of the Blitz. The commission comes from Siegfried Bettmann, a very prominent local industrialist, and originates as a monument to his wife, Annie, who died in 1942. Bettmann, born in Nuremberg, was a key figure in Coventry's prosperity. He founded the Triumph Motor Bicycle Company, sorry, Bicycle Company in 1889, and then the Triumph Motor Bicycle Company, and becomes mayor of Coventry in 1913. Although a naturalised British citizen, Bettmann was forced by anti-German hysteria during the First World War to resign as mayor. And his company, which was by 1918 the biggest maker of motorbikes in the world, diversified into car production in the interwar years. His chosen sculptor was George Ernest, a Viennese who came to London in the late 30s to exhibit his work. 
as a Jew, though a non-observant one, Ehrlich decided to remain in England after the Nazis invaded Austria in 1938. Well, the crematorium did not permit sculpted memorials to individuals, so Beckmann's memorial to his wife becomes a more general symbol and statement of love and loss. He wrote to Ehrlich, I quote, I have only one wish, to perpetuate the memory of my dear wife and to show her and my affection for our native city. Uh, I'm sorry, for our adopted city, unquote. But the monument retains a private character. To Kenneth Clark, who was a friend and patron, the sculptor wrote, I wanted the figure intimate and not monumental, unquote. And the full-sized bronze resembles Roman tomb sculptures of draped reclining figures leaning on one elbow or as here against a back support. It rests on a stone bier inscribed with, with the letters Puck, which were designed by another emigre, the architect Fritz Landau. Landau had fled Germany in 1933 and came to London where he designed shops and two synagogues. Without any architectural work during the Second World War, he founded the Monumental Art Company to design tombs and memorials. And he and Erhoff decided to position this memorial beside a reflective pool. The railing which now surrounds the pool rather spoils the effect as do the water stones on the bronze surface. Well, Pax does feature in recent histories of emigre art in this country, but in the Coventry context, it assumes a very different meaning. The Beckman, a key figure in Coventry's industry, should commission this as a gesture of peace is remarkable. A remarkable too that both his chosen sculptor and architect come from the German-speaking country. Well, both Ehrlich and Landauer were well suited to respond to post-war Britain's appetite for public art. But Ehrlich's work is much more somber than the sculpture of other emigres like Siegfried Charu. Given Pax's dedication to the more than 600 victims of the Coventry Blitz, this is not surprising. But his work comes out of a central European tradition of poignant memorials, quiet statements of loss, rather than heroic monuments. And I'm thinking of The Bond Child by Ehrlich in Chelmsford Cathedral, another example of that. Well, when I found that the bronze maquette for Pax was in the Vienna Museum, I envisaged it might make a great starting point for the exhibition. Um, the photo of that maquette is on the left-hand screen. Um, it's in the Coventry archives. I just put it up next to Lorenzetti's painted image of Pax from the Town Hall in Siena. Pax there leans back upon a pillow and underneath it is squatting armour. So in pieces is taking precedence over the warlike Pax. Ehrlich's uh, Monument of Pax, a figurative sculpture in the classical tradition, marks the start of a trajectory which moves to the expressive, highly textured surface of Wagstaff's Naiad and culminates with Shoplander's 3D Series 1 in welded steel of Warwick Campus. So I envisaged it as perhaps the beginning of a a kind of arc of different approaches to sculpture, different uh, techniques and um, ways of using sculpture in public places. But sadly, the cost of transport and insurance to bring the maquette from Vienna meant this was not to be. Um, other things that got away were a study by Elizabeth Frink for the Eagle Lectern in the cathedral, drawings of inscriptions by John Skelton, which needed costly conservation, 
and an archive photo of the house in Leamington Spa designed by Hidalgo Moya for his mother, which was inaccessible due to the closure of the RIBA and its collection. Um, and overall, I think uh, Modern Mercia has been received extremely positively. Um, we've had some really um, wonderful feedback about the exhibition, particularly from people who, um, who've grown up in the area and who perhaps are familiar with these works or have, have gone past them uh, every day of their lives and, and are now very excited to actually be able to learn more about them. And we've had a lot of feedback of people who have come in and been talking about how they grew up in the 50s and 60s and how they saw these things being installed or how they knew the artists or how they were at the art school. So I think um, I'm, I, we're both very proud of this exhibition and, and particularly pleased that we seem to have um, achieved our aim to uh, raise the uh, profile of, of many of these artworks and, and increase public recognition of them and we hope that that this will continue into the future and that uh, people will really appreciate some of the these artworks which which they live with and perhaps which they, they they start to take for granted when they see every day but perhaps this will allow them to to reconsider and um, re, um, reassess these works so um, thank you very much Louise for, for talking to me today and and for, for helping so much with the exhibition and um, I hope you in, uh, hope you enjoyed the talk. So thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>